Oh, sigh. Not sure I actually said sigh out loud instead of sighing. Anyway. This is the last knot. My dad told me to say this. We have to talk about the IPL trades again, which I'd love to do if there were any actual trades. I would be all for it. In fact, I'm desperate for T20 to start having some proper trades. I love trades in you know other sports like the NBA and Aussie Rules Football. Um, but these are transfers and really just dumping players off your books for cash as much as anything. They seem to be more like purchasing orders. And I've been talking about T20 trades since, I don't know, 2017 maybe? They just don't make a lot of sense. As a sporting team, you collect talent. And even if you no longer want or need that talent, when you get rid of it, it is your job to get as much back as possible. You have a player that clearly other teams want, and you should be maximizing this through your own list. So I regret to inform you that again, teams of professional cricket leagues around the world are not doing that. Gujarat gave Lockie Ferguson 10 crawl for last year, and he gave them his second worst IPL season ever, really. And I thought he was poor, at least by his own incredible standards, in the World Cup. His figures still looked okay. I mean, he had a good bowling average. But he was going at over eight and over in a tournament where so many bowlers, including pretty much all of his teammates, were not. So you can understand why Gujarat wanted to move on a little bit. They have Alzari Joseph, who they might see as someone who is a potential replacement. Although Joseph has had a weird career in T20 so much and that he really hasn't played a lot of it. But anyway, it looks like he will be their number one pacer. So fine, get rid of Lockie. I understand that. But why only ask for money back? I mean, not only are the Gujarat owners rich as hell, didn't they just pay a ginormous amount for this franchise? What on earth are they going to do with that little bit of money from Kolkata that's going to make a huge difference to their team? Especially when you look at it as Kolkata is the weaker team in this trade. Remember, Pat Cummins isn't coming back. And I mean, after last year, and maybe even overall, that may not be a bad thing. But from a Kolkata perspective, that means that they weren't going to have Lockie Ferguson or Pat Cummins, two of their mainstays. And quite clearly, they were desperate to get Ferguson back. Shouldn't there be a couple of younger players involved there? Because Gujarat are losing a player that probably other teams would have wanted as well. Ferguson is still incredibly well respected, even on the back of one poorish IPL season. So this doesn't really make a lot of sense to me at all. But it wasn't even the only player KKR bought from Gujarat. They also picked up Raman Gurbas. Now this could be interesting because he's not played in the IPL yet, but he does strike at over 150 while averaging nearly 30. He's coming off a poor World Cup at CPL, but he absolutely smashed it in the Asia Cup. So, you know, Asian conditions. Of course, if he averages 28 in all T20 cricket, that's bound to come down when he plays in the IPL, unless he's playing at his absolute peak. As far as Kolkata are concerned, last year they used Sam Billings and Sheldon Jackson as their keepers. Both of them are gone. KKR are pretty much paying for the fact that after Dinesh Karthik left, they didn't really make a strong enough move for anyone else. And I wouldn't think Gerbaz is their final play, but it means this was a very handy pickup before the auction. They don't have to fight anyone else for a wicked keeper here. They have someone on the books, and it was probably just a bit of a throw in with Ferguson. And if you look at Gujarat, they had Ritam and Saha and Matthew Wade on their books. They probably didn't need a third wicket keeper. But again, Gerbaz is worth something, especially to Kolkata as they were about to get rid of every other major wicket keeper on their books. Let's move away from the Kolkata trades for a moment and have a look at Jason Berendorf, who has moved from RCB to Mumbai. Now, in terms of pay, he was getting about three packets of crisps and a half-drunk Sprite Zero. And he certainly had a weird IPL career. In fact, because he's not really had an IPL career. So far, he's played five games for Mumbai with a middling record back in 2019. As far as RCB go, they have David Willey last year. And while he weirdly didn't take many wickets for them, his econ was actually really low. But he only bowled 11 overs. But he's a left-arm seamer who likes the new ball. And in his case, can actually hit a little bit as well. So you can understand why they might want to get rid of Berendorf. That makes sense. But why would they give him to Mumbai for only cash? The Ambani's will happily buy any players as often as they can in the IPL. They have shown that again and again, and it almost always embarrasses the team who just flick that player away. And we also know that Mumbai are bleeding talent-wise. And we know that they'll do anything to get more South Pole scene because they're virtually addicted to it. And yet they've just been gifted exactly what they want for free. And by free, I mean, it didn't cost the Ambani's any money that they wouldn't have found in their change purse. And that brings us to the only actual trade, although depending on how it is reported, it's not always talked about as a trade. Shardul Takur is the most expensive bowler in the IPL, not in actual costs, uh, but in economy rate. 
And last year he had for the first time ever a little bit of T20 hitting included in that. In fact, he made almost 70% of his career IPL runs last season. I thought his pay packet was a bit of a reach last year, especially for a smart team like Delhi. But while his bowling struggled, getting some runs at a strike rate of 137 was at least a boost. But I also don't blame Delhi for getting rid of him. He hasn't had a year of being under an economy of 8.5 since 2017, and he's got a pretty poor average, all things considered. And his batting at the moment is handy more than anything else. But going to KKR is interesting as they often try players in different spots and he could be used as a power play attacker when teams are using more pace. I think sometimes the idea of Shardul is better than the reality of Shardul when it comes to IPL cricket. So who is this well-known and well-paid player traded for? Aman Khan, a 26-year-old player with one IPL game in which he was involved in nine balls, six with the ball and three with the bat. An all-rounder who has a 187 career professional run so far and six wickets. He's a long lever power hitter who's never made runs at the professional level, but you can see just below that he has some juice. Although he does have this weird kink in his swing, which means he kind of slices through the ball, and I wonder how that will translate at the top level. And his bowling looks fairly unremarkable on first glance. So KKR took a guy who has been around the traps for a few years but has only ever played one IPL game and they turned him into Lockie Ferguson, Shatul Takur and Ramanala Gurbaz. Obviously some cash was involved but that's quite a haul. KKR had a poor year and now they've picked up almost for free an international keeper, their old star bowler and probably an overpaid all-rounder at the very least that they might be able to turn into something slightly different. And all it cost them was a player who will be 26 by the time the next season comes around and has only played once in IPL cricket. Now, Aman Khan might be a star, but I find it hard to think he'll ever have the impact of the other three players here. But that's not to say that for Gujarat, a middle-order spin hitter who can bowl one or two overs of seam is not handy. But Aman Khan and a bunch of cash is not nearly enough for the haul that KKR ended up with here. And let's talk about the cash size of things. Is it weird that we don't know how much? This is partly because we don't have beat riders for the IPL teams but also because the teams just don't tell us anything. I find that weird because we know exactly how much all these players get at the auction and then once they're traded or shifted or delisted, whatever this may be, transferred, we just don't know about the money anymore. And yes, my thought about getting the most back for a player is the best option, but teams will privately tell you other things. They'll point to the cash, something that they can use on analytics, strength and conditioning, scouting, whatever they can to improve their players. And I get that. But these owners have a lot of money. Do they really need to lose Shadul Takur just to boost their analytics department? The other thing I'm told a lot is that teams often sell players early so they don't have to fight with more sides when it comes to the auction. If RCB want another left arm seamer, they now don't have to worry about Mumbai going after their first choice. Actually, that's probably a bad example because Mumbai will probably still go for all left arm seamers just out of reflexes. The other main thing that I got from chatting to IPL insiders is even when one side goes into it properly, the other teams just don't really understand how trades work. And so they always either ask for cash or offer cash. And that is absolutely something that Mumbai has exploited for a long time and KKR certainly did this year. Mumbai just picked up one of the most talented left arm quicks outside the IPL, which is their happy place. And KKR just restocked their cupboard without having to even turn up at the auction yet. And why is all this important? Because when you make a trade, it is important that you take something from your opposition. You're going to have to play against these teams. RCB, Gujarat and Delhi are going to have to try and beat Kolkata and Mumbai to make the finals and perhaps win the finals. Khan Khan for two IPL regulars and a potential overseas keeper is a terribly one-sided deal. And maybe the other teams can make it up in the auction. But if they can't, they just allow Mumbai and KKR to get a little bit stronger. Considering the wealth that the owners of these two teams did, they managed to make their teams better for not much more than what it would cost you or me to get a cup of coffee. 